اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, welcome to uh, our sixth class ان شاء الله in this blessed program tafsir program for this year 2021 yesterday we talked about um, the first main part of Surah Al-Baqarah about Banu Israel and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stripped them of their status and what the things and the crimes they fell into is uh, are and some of the characteristics of the Banu Israel of old those at the time of Musa alayhi salam uh, today's lesson inshallah ta'ala and I'll share my screen it's going to be about uh, Banu Israel or uh, Ahl al-Kitab, the Yehud, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The time Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Um, the Jews at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's what the, this part of Surah Al-Baqarah is about, and it's all, until the end. Of the first Jews And obviously we're going to go over it quickly inshallah And hopefully tomorrow we'll finish Surah Al-Baqarah So today we'll finish off this second part And to, uh, this first part, main part of Surah Al-Baqarah And tomorrow we'll take the second part So talking about uh, some of their characteristics That's what it is about Starting from لكم, After the story of the Baqarah After the story of the cow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he talks about the Jews at the time of the Prophet. They have a few characteristics. Um, we're not going to mention all of them. And I've tried to group some of the ayat into more general or uh, some characteristics that might combine a few of the ayat, inshallah. We won't stop on every ayah, but we just want to have a understanding of the path that they took and why they have incurred the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want to know this for no other reason other than the fact that we want to avoid these actions we want to avoid these actions and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about it in his book طيب. some of the characteristics are first and foremost lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that seems to be a very prominent characteristic of the Jews and of the Christians as well and this basically is a characteristic of anyone that uh, comes up with any sort of innovation or anyone that changes the religion of Allah then he will have this characteristic because he will inevitably be lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will be claiming something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or he will claim that Allah is pleased with something without having any proof and many many ayat here in Surah Al-Baqarah have touched upon this um, but if we look at it um, there are two main categories one part is where they change Allah's religion right and the other parts where they make false claims they come up with things they've got no proofs for Okay, so one of them is where you have actual revelation from Allah, either directly from Allah in the book or through the messengers, and then you change it. And changing it, my dear brothers and sisters, doesn't always need to be uh, changing the actual words. It doesn't have to be changing the actual words. This is something, yes, that the Christians and the Jews have done. They've changed their books. They've changed the actual words of Allah. Uh, but changing the meaning is also considered to be changing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When you take the meaning or when you take the words but you give it your own meaning Or you give it a meaning other than the meaning that the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has, has given us This is also consider, considered to be changing Allah's words and turning it away from its intended meaning And he has the same ruling in that regard and it's also obviously considered lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what did Banu Israel do? Now the first thing they did is they blatantly 
change the ayat. Okay, that's one thing they did. They blatantly changed the ayat. How did they do that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions straight after the story of the Baqarah. He says, lakum. Allah says, do you have any hope, O oh Muslims, or oh believers, that they will believe in you? Yani these Jews, do you have any hope that they will believe in you when the reality is, when their situation is, that some of them would um, hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then change it. Some of them would hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and after hearing it, they would change it. After hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and after understanding it and comprehending it, they would change it because it wouldn't go uh, in line with their desires So Allah is telling us How can you have hope in such an individual That he will believe When this is his state That's one of them um, Also on top of that Is that they would Actually write Certain verses with their own hands And then say This is from Allah Like Allah mentions here That uh, وَمِنْهُمْ Allah mentions فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ Woe be to those that write the book with their own hands and then they say ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ This is from Allah. Why do they do this? لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا So that they can achieve some kind of worldly benefit. فَوَيْلُ لَهُمْ مِمَّا كَتَبَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Woe to them or woe to that which their hands have written and فَوَيْلُ لَهُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ And woe to them for that which they have which they will deserve from punishment so again um, they would change Allah's words directly and they would also make up ayat or verses and say this is from Allah all of this changing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions a beautiful ayah which will come later on in the surah but it is relevant here Allah says sell Bani Israel kam atainahum min ayatin bayyinah that ask the children of Israel, كَمْ آتَيْنَاهُمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ بَيِّنَةٍ How many clear signs have we give them, given them? How many clear signs have we given them? Showing them that Muhammad is a true prophet. Showing them that another prophet would come after Isa السلام, and that they should believe in him. How many clear signs have we given them? وَمَنْ يُبَدِّلْ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهِ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ And Allah mentions that whoever changes the blessing of Allah after it has come to him, then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe in punishment. And pay attention to, pay attention to this word you used here, نِعْمَةَ الله. Allah says whoever changes the blessing of Allah. Allah didn't say whoever changes the words of Allah, whoever changes the ayat of Allah. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said whoever changes the blessing of Allah here. Showing us that the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these signs, they are indeed a blessing. They are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This knowledge and these signs and these ayat and the verses of Allah, they are a blessing of Allah. And whoever ch- takes that blessing and then changes it, yes, then Allah mentions that he is severe in punishment. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. <clears throat> okay, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that they would make false claims. And that also is one of the forms of lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making false claims. That's also one of the forms of lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that they would make false claims. Some of those false claims they make were, uh, first and foremost, um, they claim that even if they are punished, they said that the punishment would only um, befall upon us and will only be punished for a few hours or just for a few days. Sorry. They would say and they claim that the nar or the punishment or the hellfire wouldn't touch them apart for just a few days. Yani, that they would never be um, in nar for longer than that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he refutes this statement uh, by saying, um, Have you 
taken a covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised you that if he does punish you, that he won't punish you except for a few days? Then Allah says, if that's the case, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not break his promise. أَمْ تَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Or is it actually the case that you are saying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and talking about him with no knowledge? And that is the case. And also the claim that no one would go Jannah except for them. Okay? They claim that no one لَن يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَصَارًا They said that no one will enter Jannah except if they are Jews or if they are Christians. They're the only ones that will enter Jannah. Again, a false claim. What makes them claim this? What proof have they got from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to prove this? Likewise, uh, some of their claims such as uh, and that the akhirah is only for them. Okay? Allah mentions, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَتْ لَكُمُ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَالِصَةً مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ فَتَمَنَّوا الْمَوْتِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah refutes them here. They said that the akhirah is only for us. Us Jews only. No one else will benefit from the akhirah. Only we will benefit from the life after death. And the life after death and all of its goodness, يعني from Jannah and blessings, is only for us. Allah mentions, if that's the case, yes, if that's the case, then Allah says, why don't you then look forward to dying? Why don't you, you know, uh, have this hope or, you know, wanting to die? Why? Because if we knew, dear brothers and sisters, with certainty, that if we were to die right now, we'd go straight to Jannah, all of us, we wouldn't be afraid of death. Because whatever comes after death would only be blessings. And we would um, have a respite from the uh, the tests of this world and the many different uh, calamities and, and, and fitting that we go through. But obviously we don't have that guarantee. That's why we all have some level of fear. We have some level of hope. But Allah is saying to the uh, Ahl Kitab here or the Jews with regards to their claim, Allah is saying if you are that certain, then why don't you wish for death? And then Allah asserts and tells us, وَلَنْ يَتَمَنَّهُ أَبَدًا They will never ever wish for death. Ever. Rather, Allah tells us that they are the most adamant of people in terms of their love of life. No one loves to live more than them. Nobody is afraid of death more than them. Showing us their contradiction in that regard. وَلَتَجِدَنَّهُمْ أَحْرَصَ النَّاسِ عَلَىٰ حَيَاتٍ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا Allah is saying that they are even more afraid of death and more eager to live than the polytheists who don't even look forward to anything. Some of them don't even believe in Allah. Some of them, they know that there is some kind of punishment awaiting them, but, you know, they don't have a book with them. But these people, they have a book with them and still they are more eager to live and more afraid of death, showing that they know what's awaiting them. Allah is showing us here that they, it's a lie. When they say Jannah is for us, we're going to go to Jannah, they themselves know they're lying and they know it's awaiting them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. That's with regards to lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, concealing knowledge. Another thing that they are very well known for, concealing knowledge. And if we look at the ayah, the second ayah after ever, after. Uh, the story of the Baqarah, the story of the cow, Allah mentions, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا That's the, the, the hypocrites or the munafiqun from Ahl al-Kitab, those that accepted Islam uh, just to cause split amongst the ranks of the believers. When they're with the uh, believers, they say, we believe. Okay, and when they go back to each other, yes, because now they're believing, right? Or they're claiming to be believing they're, blaming, they're claiming to be Muslims so some of them would inform the Sahaba of some of the characteristics of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their Torah and some of these signs Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has mentioned in their Torah because obviously they're, they're hypocrites okay they're showing outwardly Islam so sometimes they would you know just to feel a bit more make the Sahaba feel more comfortable in that sense and to hide their nifaq and the hypocrisy, they would be like, hey, you know, these Jews, uh, you know, in their, in, in their Torah, it actually says and, 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 and tells 
uh, tells them that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is a messenger of Allah and these are the signs and these are the verses. So then when they would go back to their brothers from amongst the Jews who they're still upon the same religion in their heart as them, they would tell each other off and they would say, what's wrong with you? Are you going to tell them and inform them of some of those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given you from the truth and from these signs? Why would you do that? You know, don't tell them, don't tell these sahaba, don't tell the companions any of, of these verses in the Torah. What's wrong with you? By that they want to conceal the knowledge. And look at their reasoning for this. They said, That they might use this as a proof against you with your Lord. يعني on the day of judgment, they will come and use this against you and they will say, Oh Allah, these Jews, they told us this, this and this and they still didn't believe. They say, don't tell them. So they can't use it as a proof against you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, أَوَلَا يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهِ يَعْلَمُ مَا يُسِرُونَ وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ Do they not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that which they make apparent and that which they conceal? What difference does it make? It doesn't make a difference if you tell the Sahaba or you don't tell them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still knows that you know. And the Sahaba don't need to use anything as a proof against you on the day of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is judging between his creation because nothing is hidden from him. Just showing us their, their, their ignorance here and their, the way they think. Allah al-Musta'al. Tayyib. That's another characteristic. Concealing of knowledge. And subhanallah, my dear brothers and sisters, this is something that uh, even some of the Muslims, they fall into. So when some of the Muslims, they want to defend a certain type of falsehood or they believe in something that they know goes against the Quran and the Sunnah, right? And then they come across a hadith or an ayah that clearly refutes what they're upon. And that clearly goes against their bid'ah and their innovation, they hide the hadith or they hide the ayah. And the most hated thing to them in that regard is those that make these ayat and these hadith apparent. And they show clear animosity to those that make these hadith and ayat apparent. So when they have certain falsehood that they hold on to or certain innovation, the most hated thing to them are, th are those hadith that contradict their falsehood. And even more hated to them are those individuals that make these ahadith apparent. Such that you'll find that's the hatred they have then for the people of hadith or the people that are upon the sunnah. Why do they have hatred for them? For no other reason but that they make apparent and they clarify to the people those ayat and those ahadith that go against their falsehood. Subhanallah. So again... This is an advice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us, Ummat al-Islam. Yes, that we shouldn't fall into this. Do not conceal knowledge. If the knowledge is there, submit to it. If the haq is there and act upon it. Don't conceal it. Because indeed on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, make everything apparent and you'll be humiliated and it will be known. Another thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions from the characteristics of the Jews at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is their, uh, their contradictions okay and there's one main contradiction my dear brothers and sisters one thing that any believer any Muslim if he wants to address a Christian or a Jew before you call them to Al-Islam and before you clarify Islam to them yes which is definitely something that we should do there is one point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes in Surah Al-Ma'idah Allah says قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَسْتُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ حَتَّى تُقِيمُوا التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ وَمَا أُنْزِلِ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That, O oh, people of the book, you are, you are upon nothing. You're truly on nothing. يعني, you're upon nothing unless you establish your own books, your Torah and your Injil, you're upon nothing. لَسْتُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ Until you establish that which is in your books, Injil and Torah, and that which has been revealed to you, by your Lord. And طبعا, we're not talking about the verses that they have changed. Rather we're talking about that small percentage, Allah knows how small it is, of those verses that are still the truth. Especially those verses that show that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Those verses that have the same ahkam in common as Al-Islam, for example. May it be those verses that they have in the Torah and Injil talking about the obligation of fasting. May it be talking about the impermissibility of 
eating uh, swine meat or a pork meat, maybe the impermissibility of any of the other things, maybe whatever it is that is in their books, yes, that is still the truth. And in line with our Sharia al Islam, may it be those things about the prophets, may it be about those things that talk about Tawheed. There are some verses in the Bible and the Torah that talk about worshipping Allah alone and not associating partners with Him. So Allah says, you're upon nothing until you establish your own book. Same thing here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this argument in Surah Al-Baqarah that they're not acting upon their own book. As a people, they don't act upon their own book. You're upon nothing. So act upon your own book and the first thing you should act upon your own book is upon those verses and, and those uh, parts of your book that tell you that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a messenger of Allah and that you should follow him. That's the first thing you need to implement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that not believing in the Quran, even though it's in accordance with what's in their book, then this is from their contradictions. Okay? So Allah mentions, وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ كِتَابٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقُ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ Yes, that when a book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to them, which is in accordance to that which is already with them. So that new book from Allah is in accordance to what's with them. It is in accordance in terms of its uh, rulings and also in accordance with it as in it has the it has been foretold in their book. Yes? Then what do they do? What do they do? Kafaru bih. They disbelieve in it. Allah says, so may the curse of Allah be upon the disbelievers. Okay, so we as Muslims, طبعاً, we believe in all of the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, we believe in all of the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طبعاً, we believe in the books, generally speaking, we don't believe in what's in the Torah and Injil today because it has been altered. طيب, so not acting upon their own books. Likewise, not believing in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is from their contradictions because Muhammad is foretold in their books. And many other contradictions, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how they do not uphold their own book. Allah mentions that their own book. Here Allah mentions, mentions that we have taken the covenant from you. Okay? And, and, and Allah ta'ala mentions as well that um, He has commanded them with being good to the parents, Ihsan al speaking good to the people, and many other things. Allah Ta'ala warned them against sihr, warned them against magic. What did they do? Rather, they followed the magic and they learned the magic. So they don't, they don't uphold their own book. What do we learn from this? We learn from this that we need to uphold our own book as well as Muslims. We need to act upon the Quran and the Sunnah. If we don't and we don't act upon the Quran or we don't act upon the Sunnah, then we will have fallen into the path of those who Allah's anger is upon. Likewise, one another way that they contradict themselves is changing their own narrative you know they say one thing here and then when it doesn't suit them they say something else this is obvious this is very obvious and there's one verse here and many verses as well in the Quran generally speaking where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the the Jews at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina they would say to the Arabs okay who were uh, the Khazraj from the Ansar before they became Muslim and before Islam had reached them, they would say a prophet is going to be sent. And that prophet is going to come here to this city. And when he comes here, yes, we are going to fight alongside him and we are going to wipe you out. Okay, so they used to instill fear in the hearts of the Ansar. عنهم, before they became Muslim. And, and to the extent that the Ansar, they kind of like feared this. And that's why when they went to Mecca and they, they met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they said, Wallahi, this is what the Jews were telling us about. They said, let's make sure they don't beat us to him. So they believed in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah is telling us here how they have changed their narrative. This is something generation after generation you used to tell the Ansar or the, the Arabs in your time. And then when the Prophet has come and everything that you have foretold them has come true, with the same signs and the characteristics that you've mentioned, how can you turn away from him after that? Isn't that one of the clearest signs of contradiction that you would ever come across? So they changed their own narrative. And there are many hadith and narrations with regards to that. We know the story of Abdullah ibn Salam as well. Uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about that when the time comes, inshallah. So we have these contradictions. 
As well, another thing, another thing that they fell into, attacking the truth and its people. This animosity towards the truth. Why? Because they're upon falsehood. So anything that goes in against their falsehood, from the truth, they would attack it. And they would attack its people. That's why they killed some of the messengers. If they opposed their desires. Okay? وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا Allah mentions in, in the Quran that whenever their Rasul comes to them, بِمَا لَا تَهْوَى أَنفُسُهُمْ And he comes with that which opposes their desires, what would they do? They would kill him. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ They would kill him. Likewise, they took Jibreel as an enemy. Jibreel, who is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the angels, the connection between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between Allah and the prophets, yes, that brings the revelation, they took him as an enemy. And Allah says, whoever takes Jibreel as an enemy, then Allah is an enemy to the kafirun. And this subhanallah reminds us of what? Reminds us of, of the Rafidah, the Rafidah Shia, the extreme ones of them from the Rafidah, they also take Jibreel as an enemy. They see Jibreel as an enemy. Taban, their reasoning is different. They say Jibreel is our enemy and they actually curse Jibreel at the end of every prayer. Why? Because they say he was meant to take the wahi or the revelation to Ali radiallahu anhu but instead he took it to Muhammad. Something they have in common with the Jews over here. And the same thing applies to them. قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِجِبْرِيلِ Whoever is a, an enemy to Jibreel then Allah mentioned at the end فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَدُوُّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Then indeed Allah is an enemy to the disbelievers Showing us that whoever takes Jibreel as an enemy He's a disbeliever Because Jibreel is a messenger from Allah And he's an angel He's an angel And the iman And the iman that we have in the angels Necessitates that we believe in them And that we love them So to take him as an enemy And Allah mentions that the angels Do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In surah Tahrim So for you to believe otherwise Would be in contradiction with the Quran And that would necessitate kufr And disbelief Another thing That is clearly One of their characteristics Is jealousy Jealousy Especially to us Ummat al-Islam Ummat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The amount of jealousy They have in their hearts My dear brothers and sisters To us you can't imagine and the main reason they have this jealousy, Wallah, it's not because of the fact that we have dunya or we have more wealth than them. No, Wallah. No, Wallah. Yani the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the Jews, the jealousy they had towards the, the Ansar, yes, and the Arabs, yes, it wasn't because of wealth because they were more wealthier at the beginning. They were much wealthier. So what was this jealousy? This jealousy was a religious jealousy. They had this jealousy, why did Allah send a prophet from amongst them and not from amongst us? Okay, that's where the, that's where the, uh, the battle started. Okay, reminds us of the story of Iblis and Adam, right? So Allah mentions that they have this jealousy towards us that they, they don't want any good to be sent to us. Allah says, مَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ those that disbelieve from Ahlul Kitab and the Mushrikun and the Polytheists, they do not want for any khair to be sent down from our Lord to us. They don't want any of the khair, any of these ayat and these ahadith and this guidance, they don't want it for us. Rather, they want us to follow their footsteps and to be upon what they're upon. And they will never be pleased with us until we follow their path so that we can go with them into Nar. That's the only thing that will please them. But as long as we hold on to the ni'mah of Allah and the blessing of Allah, which is this religion, they will be jealous of us. And they'll try their best to make us leave it. Okay? Subhanallah. And this is the shu'un. Subhanallah. The creation of Allah is ajib. Why don't you enter into Al-Islam? If you're jealous, right, of this religion, enter into Al-Islam. La, they don't want to enter into Al-Islam. Rather, they want us to join them in hellfire. A'udhu billah. Likewise, Allah mentions that Another manifestation of their jealousy is that they would love for us to return back from our religion and become kuffar. What, uh, Allah mentions, what the kathiru min ahl kitab Many of the ahl kitab they would love uh, min ba'd imanikum kuffara, if they were to turn us back as kuffar after our iman. They would love that. Why? Hasadan min indi, min indi anfusihim, because of a jealousy from, from their heart and from themselves. When did this jealousy come? Huh? This jealousy came after they, the truth has become clear to them. 
So after it became clear to them and they were certain that we have the truth and Islam is the truth, that's when the jealousy started. Subhanallah. That's when the jealousy started. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَعْفُوا وَصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Allah says, then forgive and forget and, and be patient until Allah comes with His promise. Until Allah comes with His promise. Taman, that was at, at the beginning time when they lived in Medina and the Muslims were still weak. You know, Allah is saying, you know, hold out and be patient. Okay? Up for, be patient. Tayyip. Their jealousy and subhanAllah we can continue talking about this for hours. The jealousy of Al Kitab and the Jews is very obvious. But there's one thing that we need to know, dear brothers and sisters. Their jealousy for us is not because of the dunya. La Allah is not because of the dunya. Their jealousy for us is because of this ni'matul Islam that we have. Their jealousy for us is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has made us the best ummah. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ Allah says Jealousy because we have the Qur'an The best of Allah's books Until the day of judgment Jealousy because our Prophet is the best of Allah's creation And the best of all Prophets Jealousy because our religion is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Until the day of judgment Jealousy, jealousy, jealousy All of it returning back to this religion of Islam So subhanallah How lost are we? How lost are we when we look at the wealth that they have and the dunya that they have and we run after it and we give our religion in return. This thing that we have that's more valuable than anything which they are jealous of. Yes? And they want us to turn away from so that we can become the same. How is it subhanallah that we sell our religion then and we go down to their level just for the sake of the dunya? And that's why subhanallah wallahi the kuffar from Ahl al-Kitab and other than them, yes, they will be more than happy to give us all the wealth that they have, yes, if we enter into their religion. They have got no issues with that. How much money have they spent in Africa and other countries and other places just to turn people to, to their religion? How many people? They're willing, wallahi, to give away their dunya. They're willing to give it away, yes, just for you to join them and their ranks and be, and be upon their misguidance so that you can all go to hellfire. And so that this fire that's raging in their heart from jealousy can go away. Because this jealousy that they have in their heart, when they see you praying to Allah five times a day, when they seeing you uh, fasting the month of Ramadan, when they see you hold on to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they have changed their religion. When they see you holding on to your religion, when they have changed their religion. When they see you following the footsteps of your prophet, when they have turned away from their prophets and killed some of them. Yes? This feeling that they have in their heart, Wallahi, they cannot eat and drink and sleep, yes, and feel good about themselves. They can't. So that rather everyone on the face of the earth is upon what they're upon, and then they say, out of sight, out of mind. What do they say? Out of sight, out of mind. They don't want to see someone that is what they were meant to be. Okay? And then, by way of that, they feel this jealousy in their heart. They rather want all of the Muslims to be upon Christianity or Judaism, and they don't care. The Jew doesn't care if you become a Christian or a Jew, and the Christian doesn't care if you become a Jew or a Christian. They don't care. As long as they don't see you doing that which they were meant to do. Because then, when it's out of sight, out of mind, now they can enjoy their dunya. Now they can look and enjoy their food and their drink and their sleep, and they can sleep without having to think about and looking at you and seeing you reminding them that hey, this is what you're meant to do. So we subhanAllah, the, the, the practicing Muslim, he's a thorn in their throat. They can't, they can't stand it. Out of jealousy, when they see you, that's why they don't want to see the beard. They don't want to see anything. Anything. That's why these countries, France and what have you, you know, they attack any manifestation of religion. They want it out of sight, out of mind. We don't want to see anything that reminds us of what we're meant to do, what we're meant to be upon. Yes? You want to worship Allah, you want to worship God, worship it in your house. Make sure nobody sees it. Then how is it, subhanAllah, when they are feeling like this, we as Muslims, we look at their dunya, and we overlook this ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has given us. Allah, there's nothing sadder than this. This is the saddest thing ever. Allah understands. So it's upon us, my dear brothers and sisters, to remind each other constantly of this great blessing. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And the Quran subhanallah from beginning till end, it keeps on reminding us of this blessing. And Allah is not telling us what the Jews have done and what the Christians have done, except to show us His ni'mah and His favor upon us. His ni'mah and His favor upon us, and that we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what better way to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than implementing His religion and following His advice. So this topic, the jealousy of the Jews and the Christians towards us, subhanallah, is a topic that just here in Surah Al-Baqarah, the first Jews, there's at least three, four, five, six ayat that just talk about this, how jealous they are. Tayyip. Another thing as well is their, them being unjust, especially when it comes to refuting or in terms of refutations, right? For example, uh, the Jews would, sh- would say, the Nasara are upon nothing. Allah says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شيء. The Jews would say, the Nasara, or the Christians, they're upon nothing. Nothing. Their, their religion is based on nothing. And the Nasara would, would say, لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شيء. The Jews, they're upon nothing. Their religion, their, their religion is based on nothing. And Allah is saying, وَهُمْ يَتُدُونَ الْكِتَابُ While they read the book. They're reading the book. And they can see the similarity between the two books. And they know that both books are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how then can you say, that they are completely upon nothing. This is going beyond bounds. This is being unjust. Because now when you say that the Jews are upon nothing. And their religion is based on nothing. Then you are you are um, dismissing some of the truth that they have which is from Allah. So Allah is teaching us here a very important akhlaq. Which is when you refute the people that oppose you. Or the people that are upon falsehood. You have to be just. You have to be just. So we say that yes. Some of what the Jews and the Christians are upon is the truth. They've got there, there are some verses left in the Torah and the Injil that are from Allah, but most of it has been altered. So, what, what do we do as Muslims? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, he gave us a very clear manhaj, a very clear path, or very clear steps to follow. He said, do not believe them and do not belie them. So, don't say when the Jews, when they come to you or the Christians, they tell you something. Don't say to them you're telling the truth and it's true. And don't say t- say to them that what you said is a lie. No. Because you don't know. It could be that it's from Allah. Instead, what do we do? We compare it to what we have in the Quran and the Sunnah. If it is in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah that we have, the revelation that we know Allah has preserved, then we say, okay, this is the truth. This thing that is found in your Bible, it is the truth. Okay? All right. If they come with something and he opposes the Quran and the Sunnah and there's a clash or a contradiction, we say this is falsehood. Okay? No questions asked. Falsehood. Okay, what if they mention something that is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah? We say Allah alam. Allah knows best. Allah knows best. We don't have the knowledge to say if it's falsehood or truth. Because we as Muslims, we only have that source. That's our source. Wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Quran and Sunnah. Especially when it comes to the knowledge of the unseen and things that happened before us. That we can only take from Quran and Sunnah, from Wahid, revelation, nothing else. Okay? So Allah is teaching us here. He has to be just. Likewise, um, Allah tells us about the Yahud as well. What would they do? They would disbelieve in the books that were revealed to any prophet but their prophets. So any prophet that would come with a book, other than the book that they have, they, would ref- they, they, they wouldn't accept it. That is being unjust as well. Especially when your book commands you to follow the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever it comes from, as long as that person is a true messenger and prophet and he has uh, the ayat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make you, that, that makes it clear to you that he is from Allah. And that's why my dear brothers and sisters, in the story of uh, Adam and Musa, what did we mention? Or the what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say after he commanded Iblis and Adam to descend to earth? If a guidance from me comes to you, then whoever follows my guidance, then no f- fear and no sadness will be upon him. What do we learn from this? What do we benefit from this? That it doesn't matter which prophet comes with that guidance. Okay? As long as that guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we accept it. That's why we as Muslims, alhamdulillah, we believe in all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of his messengers. And we do not deny any of it. 
We believe in all of them. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله. We do not differentiate between any of them. We don't say this one is more truthful than that one. لا. All of them are from Allah. The source is one. All of it is a message from Allah. All of it is guidance. Okay? But the fact remains that the only guidance that we have in our hands today that hasn't been altered is the Quran and the Hadith. Everything else before that, Allah alam, we don't know. That's why we withhold. But we believe in it, generally speaking, that it is from Allah. So the Torah is from Allah. The Injil is from Allah. Generally speaking. But that doesn't mean we believe in what's in it today because it has been altered. Uh, finally, the breaking of covenants. And this is again something that we covered yesterday as well. They break their covenants. Um, they break their covenants and they don't uphold their covenants. Now this, my dear brothers and sisters, are some of the characteristics of the Jews at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And we notice here that it's not much different from their forefathers. That were upon the same path at the time of Musa alayhi salam, those uh, Jews that opposed Musa alayhi salam and did what they did, which we mentioned yesterday. We can see a big overlap here. And likewise, my dear brothers and sisters, today it's still the same. Today it's still the same. They're still upon the same path. Okay? Just look at what they're doing, look at the world, look at what's happening, you'll find it's the same thing. Okay, and many other characteristics that we haven't mentioned here, but these are just some of them, and you'll find that it's still the case. Okay, so we shouldn't be surprised. We should not be surprised. طيب. Then after that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala concludes and He gave them a final admonition. Okay, just like the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala started off uh, addressing Banu Israel with. This advice or this admonition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended this, uh, if you like, chapter or this portion of Surah Al-Baqarah about Banu Israel with advice once again. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us advice. After all of this speech that we have talked about, Allah said, وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ That the Jews and the Christians will never be pleased with you until you follow their path. What is their path, dear brothers and sisters? That they want us to follow all of the things that we've mentioned. All those evil characteristics and all those crimes that they did. Yes? They were not pleased with us until we followed them upon doing the same thing. Assalamu alaikum. I think I lost connection there for a moment. Taib. Can everybody hear me? Okay, let's continue. We said that they will not be pleased with us until we follow their path. What is their path? Everything that we've mentioned so far. Okay? And more than that. طيب. قُلْ إِنَّ Allah mentions قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَى That indeed the guidance of Allah is the true guidance. The guidance from Allah. And not the guidance of the Jews and the Christians and what they've changed in their books. La, Allah is saying that's not guidance. The guidance, true guidance is the guidance from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is addressing his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But of course it's for us to learn this lesson. He's saying that if you were to follow their desires, after that which has come to you from knowledge, yani from the Quran and revelation, if you were to follow their desires, Indeed, you will not have besides Allah any friends or any helpers. So Allah is addressing His Messenger and for us to learn that we shouldn't follow their desires. And if we do, they will not help us. They will not help us. Today they can give you wealth. Today they can promise you whatever they can from this world and, and, and try and buy you over. But on the Day of Judgment, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you and holds you to account, they will go missing. They won't be able to help you. They themselves will need help and nobody will be able to help them. So please pay, pay attention to that, dear brothers and sisters. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, الَّذِينَ أَتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ تَلُونَ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ أُولَئِكَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَمَا يَكْفُرْ بِهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Allah mentions in this kitab, in here that, 
those that we've given the book to, then they follow it the way it should be followed. Okay? So those, Allah is teaching us, telling us, that those that have been given the book, yes, and follow it the way it should be followed, then indeed they are the ones that believe in it. So from the signs that you believe in the book, is that you follow its commands, and that you follow it. So Allah is telling us, the ones that, those that follow what's in the books, they are the ones that truly believe. For us to learn from that we, if we, the sign that we believe, is that we follow, and we act upon the book. And likewise, it's also a refutation against the Jews and the Christians that, you know, the fact that you contradict, you contradict your own book shows that you don't even believe in your own book. You don't even believe in your own book, let alone believing in, in other books. And then Allah um, concludes the advice with the same ayah, the exact same ayah mentioned at the beginning. Ya Bani Israel, alaykum. O Banu Israel, remember my favor upon you, that I have favored you with, and that I have given you precedence over everyone else. Remember this. Remember this, don't forget this. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا and fear a day لَا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا When no soul will be able to help another soul. Or will be able to benefit another soul. Again, a similar ayah as the one at the beginning of, of this portion. لَا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَلَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْهَا عَدْلٌ And no ransom will be accepted from it. وَلَا تَنْفَعُهَا شَفَاعَةً And no intercession will benefit it. يعني that soul. The previous verse said uh, لا يقبل منها شفاعة So they can't intercede for others. ولا تنفع شفاعة in this ayah and neither will other, other people's intercession benefit them. So on that day you can't give any شفاعة to anyone except with Allah's permission. Except with Allah's permission. If Allah permits for you to do شفاعة you make شفاعة. Likewise, no one will benefit from a shafa'ah on that day unless Allah is pleased with him. So, there is no shortcut in our religion. You can't uh, try and please some of Allah's creation by worshipping them or calling upon them and then, you know, achieve their shafa'ah if you like and thinking that you're going to achieve their shafa'ah and then by way of that, enter into Jannah while Allah is not pleased with you. لا, nobody can force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he's pleased with you, then he will allow others to make shafa'ah for you. If Allah is not pleased with you, nobody can make shafa'ah for you. No one. Not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or any other prophet. So it's all about pleasing Allah, not pleasing his creation. And if Allah is pleased with you, then everyone else can make shafa'ah for you. And everyone else will make shafa'ah for you. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wallahi wa billahi wa tallahi, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not make shafa'ah except for those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. Hasha Lillah. It is not possible that Muhammad وسلم, will intercede for someone that he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with because he was upon kufr and shirk. Hasha Lillah. Abadan. The Prophet won't make shafa'a for those that, that associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even those that worship him besides Allah, those that call upon him besides Allah. Prophet وسلم, did something that he fought and he went against and something that he warned against. Don't worship me. Do not go beyond bounds when it comes to me. So you calling upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is the, if you're looking for something that disqualifies you from shafa'ah, anything, and if, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for something that disqualifies you from shafa'ah, then the number one thing that will disqualify you from the shafa'ah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is calling upon him. Because it's shirk. That displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disqualifies you from shafa'ah, and it likewise angers the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it will be said to him on the day of judgment when a group of the people that he thinks are from his ummah and they're turned away from the hawd and the Prophet said, my ummah, my ummah, he will say and he will, say to him, he will be said to him, you don't know what they have innovated after you and then he will say, suhqan, suhqan, liman baddala wa ghayyar go away and you know, hellfire for those that have changed and, and changed what I've come with so don't think you are pleasing anyone by committing shirk in that regard. Tayyib, this is the conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, of this speech about Al-Kitab. After this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something really important. And this point is something that we are going to postpone and we're going to 
try and address it in one go. And there are some verses with regards to this that we've come across so far that I have jumped, which is the point of what they call Abrahamic religions. Okay? So, obviously, there are some people, and the first people to try and the first people that try to sell this agenda are the Jews and the Christians themselves. They're the first ones that want all of the Muslims to believe, hey, we're part of the family, we're all Abrahamic religions, we all follow Ibrahim. Yes? Ibrahim, you know, we all were the monotheistic religions and we're Abrahamic religions. We're all uh, divine religions from God. Yes? We're upon the same thing. It doesn't matter. You know? We'll all go to Jannah. The first people that try to sell this are the Jews and the Christians. Before we get to those Muslims that have been deceived by them or those Muslims with ulterior motives, before we get there, right? The first people that try to sell this agenda are the Jews and the Christians themselves. For the same reason that we mentioned earlier, because of their jealousy. Because of their jealousy. Because they know that if we submit to this or we accept this, that we are no different than them. It, will, it makes them feel better, my dear. It makes them feel better. When, they, when we say to, the, to them that, hey, yeah, we're upon the same thing, we'll all go gender together, Ah, it makes them feel better. Okay? That's why they are so adamant in, in, in pushing this agenda. Right? But this is a very important topic. Okay? And we need to address this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed it in many different ways. And Allah has refuted this claim in the Quran in many places. And this is one of the refutations. After talking about Banu Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about Ibrahim alayhi salam for two, two pages and a half. Okay? These two pages and a half are about Ibrahim alayhi salam and what religion he was upon and the Tawheed he was upon. Why did Allah mention this straight after talking about Banu Israel? To show us the contrast. Hey, this is what Ibrahim was upon, this is what the Jews were upon. That's something we've seen so far. And Allah now is going to show us what Ibrahim alayhi salam was upon. Okay? Showing us the contrast. That how can they claim, yes, that they're upon the path of Ibrahim alayhi salam and they are following his religion when this was Ibrahim. Ibrahim was Hanif and Musliman. And he wasn't and he wasn't from the Jews or the Christians. Allah mentions this straightly in the Quran. So there are no there is no such thing called Abrahamic religions. And one clear way to refute it, or one way to th- look at it is question how many religions did Ibrahim have? When we say Abrahamic religions, Kaif, Ibrahim was one person. How can one person have three religions? Is this possible, dear brothers and sisters? Can one person have three religions? How can Ibrahim be upon three religions? How can these three religions that contradict each other with different principles, different sources, different legislations, different, you name it, followers and everything, and sects, how can these three religions, yes, all come from the same person? How can one person have three religions? It doesn't make sense. So there are no Abrahamic religions. Ibrahim alayhi salam only had one religion, and that's the religion of Tawheed, the religion of Islam. That's it. And we will clarify that inshallah when we get to Surah Ali Imran. Surah Ali Imran, Allah Ta'ala has addressed this in more detail. So the ayat that we are relevant to that topic in Surah Al-Baqarah, we'll mention it over there as well inshallah ta'ala. But I just want you to pay attention here. And these two pages and a half, we're going to postpone them until we get to Ali Imran and we'll take the benefits from these two pages and a half. And tomorrow we'll start from Sayyukul Sufaha inshallah. Which is the first step or the first ayah which now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us as Ummat al-Islam and showing us how we can fulfill the guidance and be upon guidance and oppose what the Jews were upon in that sense. Okay? So inshallah ta'ala that is something that we will cover uh, in due course. Bi-idhnillah. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallama ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Any questions? Can you tell us what ayah these are for those who don't speak Arabic? Barakallahu um, feek. When you mention the above, if you mean everything that we've covered so far, then inshallah ta'ala, and I do apologize, but I am working on the notes. Inshallah, I'll release all of it uh, together with the notes, inshallah. Uh, in this same format, 
Oh, if the Jews were so jealous. Yeah. So again, so with regards to the previous point, inshallah, I will put together some notes with references to the ayat as well, inshallah, something that you can uh, benefit from. Obviously, when we were explaining, we did show the ayat to the right um, for the most part. And inshallah, I will, like I mentioned, uh, make that available, inshallah. If the Jews were so jealous, why they didn't just accept Islam? Yeah, this is this is the one of the mysteries in life, my dear brothers and sisters. Why don't they just accept Islam? I don't have an answer to that. It's it's a similar question to if Iblis, la'anahullah, may Allah curse him, knows that he's going to be punished, and he does, why doesn't he just repent? It's a similar question. This is one of the ajib things, if you like, right? And it goes back, obviously, it goes back to the to their khubth and their evil and, and, and their misguidance and their stubbornness and everything else that you can think of. And this disease, my dear brothers and sisters, jealousy, it does weird things and it does very bad things. There are a few diseases of the heart once they take hold of the heart, people, they do things that are illogical. Arrogance, for example, when someone feels arrogant, you'll find that he thinks he's the best in the world when in essence, he is nothing, right? And, and, and they live in a sort of like imaginary world. Same thing with jealousy. When someone becomes jealous, he will hate something without even knowing why he hates that thing. Okay? So jealousy is what blinded them. Okay? It's jealousy that blinded them. And maybe they don't accept Islam out of their hatred for Muslims. So it's like, hey, we know Islam is the truth, but because these Arabs, yes, are Muslim, and because they're upon Islam and this jealousy that they had, and as well racism, if you like, because this, this was as well a very big reason why the Jews didn't accept Muhammad wasallam. They said, how can, be an, how can he be an Arab? Yes, we are Banu Israel. Yes, we are from this lineage, Right? All the prophets were from our lineage. We're not going to follow an Arab. That That is one of the reasons as well why they didn't just accept Islam. Racism, jealousy, out of hatred. Sometimes there is something that is good for you, but out of hatred for people that do it, you don't do it. Just because you don't want to resemble them. Sometimes that happens, right? This illog illogical kind of way of thinking. So there are many reasons behind that. and It's one of the mysteries in life. But... Let's not get stuck on that. The important thing for us is that we don't follow into that path ourselves. Okay? That we don't become jealous of someone or something yes, yeah, such that it blinds us. They have been blinded by their jealousy. They have been blinded by their racism. Okay? We need to be sure we don't follow into, fall into the same thing. Sometimes, subhanAllah, some individuals, they become stubborn upon their misguidance based on racism. You know, people in my country that are upon this path this is the path of my forefathers, you know. I'm not going to follow this other path. I'm not going to follow this sunnah. La, I'm going to stay on this. A lot of Muslims, unfortunately, even fall into that. So we need to be aware of that. Truth comes to us. It doesn't matter if the truth opposes our fathers, our forefathers, or our whole tribe. The truth should be more beloved to us. Is Judaism a race or a religion? Well, it's both, in a sense. Um, in a sense that for them, Jews, they believe you have to be born a Jew, right? They don't just accept you into their religion like we as Muslims do. Hey, tafaddali. No, they don't, they don't do that. They won't accept you to be a real Jew unless you come from that lineage, right? And it's actually through the mother. That's a different story altogether. And it's also religion in a sense. It's also religion in a sense. They turned religion into race. Religion should never be race. A religion should never be based on a race. But they turned it into race. That's what they did. All right? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with the truth to all nations and all people. They said, no, let everybody else follow it. We're not going to follow it. Why are we not going to follow it? Because we're of a different race and he's of a different race. That's not for us. We want a prophet from our race. Then we'll follow him. So if Allah, they claim, for them, if Allah had sent another prophet with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or after Muhammad from their race, they would have followed him. That's what they're claiming, obviously, but we know that they killed prophets before that. But that's what they're claiming. Okay, inshallah we'll, we'll conclude with that. Uh, inshallah, see you tomorrow. Barakallah feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.